holy, holy, thank you. If you will, be seated. Yeah, yeah, sit down if you can. I say that all the time because, uh, man, what a privilege it is to preach after anointed worship like that. I'm serious. And it happens every week. They are just used by God greatly and masterfully. We have some of the most talented and gifted people. I'm serious. This is, this is commercial almost, you know. I mean, this could happen at a studio somewhere uh, and put on some kind of uh, commercial type deal because that's just great. And to think that a church our size and, and a ministry, you know, uh, that is of, of limited amount of people, you know, we're not, a, we're not a big mega church or anything like that. And to have this many people that are this talented that love the Lord and, and will give themselves to, for their talents and their gifts to be used like this. And some of them even learn it. I mean, they don't know it. It's not like, oh boy, we come into Freedom River because we want to do this. You know, we're going to get in the band. We're gonna... No, it, some of them didn't even know what to do. And they said, what can we do to be helpful? And they learn something. You know, it's like, well, I'll learn to do this. And they do it and God just blesses it, man. I'm telling you, whoo. You know the greatest ability that you have? The greatest av- ability that you have is availability. That's right. You say, man, I'm not able. I'm not able. I, well, God loves to take not able and make it into able. And he'll do that if you'll commit it. You know, if you say, man, I'm available, God. What, what can you do through me? I'm available. And then he'll take your availability, and that's the greatest thing. I tell you what, if you make yourself available to God, he'll wear you out. Uh, he will. He'll just wear you out because, like I said earlier, Jesus said, look out into the fields. They're white unto harvest because the, the, the laborers are few. The fields are white, but the laborers are few. Not we got so many laborers, there's not enough room to get out in the fields and work. No, he said, the fields are overflowing. It's always the laborers that are few. So don't, don't make no mistake, man. You can always be used by God. The Holy Spirit is unbelievable. Today, I know you see we're talking, and I didn't put you a little outline out because I didn't want to preach the message in the outline. It's some very simple thoughts about, about this time of year and the passages that deal with this time of year. You guys are aware. Many of you have been with the Lord a long time, and you're aware that basically the Christmas story occupies a couple of places in the Scripture Matthew chapter 1, which is uh, Matthew's accounts of the events and the, and the Holy Spirit's inspiration about what the facts are and what the important issues, and, and they have some different insights and different, they expose different aspects than Luke does. Luke chapter 1 and 2 really is the most expansive and tells us more about what happened behind the scenes and how it came about and how it came to pass. So Luke chapter 2 is a very familiar passage. And then John gets in it on a big, broad sense. I mean, he goes into the supernatural heavens and tells us about the Word of God and Him being there in creation and the Word becoming flesh and being born among men. And so the Bible just really gives us those little narratives uh, about Jesus and what we celebrate now. So I want to take the well-read story and the well-known story from the Gospel of Luke, and let's just look at a little word of God today and see if God can inspire us in this Christmas season uh, to, uh, to grasp some things that might challenge our heart and make a difference in us in, in this Christmas message, the Christmas word. We begin at verse 1, Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now that's the Christmas story of life. And I, I don't know if you've ever read it with a, with a sense of understanding what it really means, what is really happening there. I know we read it. I know many of us were introduced totally to it by Linus on Charlie Brown. I know you've heard him quote this. <laughs> and, it, and it was just so uh, captivating, the words that are said there. And this is, you know, I put it up out of the old King James so you could get the feel of that, that poetic bounce of the words that are used there. It just seems that you're just captivated by the phrases and some of the way it's said, and it just feels so right. And you say, Christ is born in the fields and the shepherds and the swaddling clothes and the angels coming down with glory to God in the highest and the city in Bethlehem and the shepherds in the field and the angels singing and praying. And, and, and many times we just look at the passage and we receive the passage and, and we're not really kind of thinking about what it's really saying about the events that went on there, because if you think about the events, what you'll come upon is that for the most part, the events that are described here are, are very mysterious. And by mysterious, I mean not, I don't mean they're hard to understand what's being said. I mean mysterious in like, how did that, how did that happen? Because when you read about certain things, if you're, if you're really, if you take that down to what happened, it's like, Gosh, how did that happen? How would that have come to pass? That sentence right there is just tremendous. And it just, there are great miracles in those few verses. And so when I read those few verses, I come away from those verses with lots more questions than I have answers. Let me, let me show you what I mean by a few of them. First, there's the mystery of the, of the taxation. Do you know that in all the history of the world, that the taxation that the Roman Empire put upon its citizens at this point was the first time ever in the history of the Roman Empire for the very first time ever. The Roman Empire was lengthy. The Roman Empire was almost worldwide. They were, uh, they were the kings of the world of their day. And they had never had a census and a taxation based on a census, and they certainly had never ever called for all of their citizens to return to the birthplace of their ancestry ever in the history of war. So for the very first time, while Mary was with child and about to be born, all of the subjects of the Roman Empire were called back to their to the, to the hometown of their greatest ancestor so, so they could pay taxes and be registered as a Roman citizen in the town of their ancestry. Of course, what this did was made sure that Mary and Joseph were both called back to the same little quaint village in the Judean hills called Bethlehem. And I'm sure it was because the prophet Micah had given a prophecy. And he wasn't the only one, but he's probably one of the clearest one. About 750 years before Jesus was born, here's what Micah said. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath. Ephrathath means uh, fruitful. But you, Bethlehem, fruitful. Are, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from the days of eternity. <laughs> Who would that be? There are only one whose rulings are of old and has been there from the beginning of eternity. And of course, this is a prophecy about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. So it, it's just mysterious to me that at this exact time, that, that, that Jesus' mom and dad 
would be called to Bethlehem so they would be there when it came time for Jesus to be born so that the prophecy would be fulfilled that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Also, there's the mystery of the success of the physical birth. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but Mary and Joseph didn't live in Bethlehem. And as a matter of fact, they, they lived in Galilee, which means they're not even in Judea, which means that they have to travel. Now, travel, don't get the idea that travel was like it is nowadays. You know better than that. They didn't get in a big SUV, lay her on some bed back there and say, all right, you are well, well, well along in your pregnancy here. So we're going to make sure that you have the safest, gentlest transfer from one place to the other. And we're going to keep you on a big, nice mattress. And we're going to make sure you don't get bounced around very much. Because physically speaking, you don't do that to heavily pregnant women. But here's Mary just a few days before time for her to be delivered. She's placed on the back of a donkey. Have any of you ever wrote, ridden a donkey? I'm telling you, the little fellas are, man, I mean, it's not the way to ride. That's all I'm telling you. A little skinny backbone right in the wrong place. And... <laughs> And you're bouncing, here you go, bouncing along, you know, right? Bouncing. So here's a woman, here's Mary, nine months pregnant, ready to pop here, and she's bouncing along on the back of a donkey for over 70 miles. You heard it right, 70 miles, about 70 miles up and down the Judean hills, around the little pig trails, around the little paths. I mean, by all physicality, by all rules of physical life, that should have affected that birth. I mean, it should have sent her into premature labor or uh, the baby might have even been stillborn or there may have been some kind of damage or crippling or, I mean, by all physical uh, rules of life, this should have been a really devastating thing to the fact that she was bounced around for days over 70 miles and then for her to uh, stop and have a normal baby in a normal way with no big mistakes that's a mysterious thing. Not only that she went to Bethlehem, and but she had a baby with a normal birth process. Here's another mystery, the virgin birth itself. Yeah, a virgin birth. All of you know what a virgin is, right? That means a woman that's never been involved sexually with a man. Now, this is a mysterious thing because I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but virgins don't get pregnant <laughs> because there's no man involved in it. As a matter of fact, Mary herself was one of the most surprised of this whole group here to find herself pregnant. The, the angel had to come to her, and the angel said, uh, Mary, I uh, got a little word for you. You have found favor with God, and you have found such favor with God that what God is going to do is God's going to plant a seed in you and you are going to conceive and, 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 that, and that seed uh, is going to be birthed and his name is going to be called Jesus and he's going to be the savior of the world. And Mary looks at the angel and Mary, here's what Mary said, how can this be? That's what she said. She said, she's a little old 16 year old girl around in there and she says, how can this be because I've never known a man. That's what Mary said. Gosh, I've never been with a man sexually. So how could I conceive and have a, and have a baby? That's ridiculous. And then Joseph was, man, Joseph was so messed up by this. I mean, you could understand when Mary tells Joseph, Joseph, I'm with seed and I'm pregnant. And uh, <clears throat> how can I explain this? Oh, uh, an angel spoke to me and said, and said this, this is from God. This seed is of the Holy Spirit has planted it in me. And Joseph's thinking in the back of his mind, well, at least the explanation is original. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Joseph thinking, come on, Mary, you hope, I hope you don't think I'm going to buy that. Yeah, that's a lot to take in. Who was it, you know? And then, the, and then God had to speak to him. And God had to say, look, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because that which is planted in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
And he shall be born, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The virgin birth itself is just a, a miraculous thing. Liberal theologians say it's impossible for that to happen. Liberal theologians say, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, the father of Jesus is either another carpenter that worked with Joseph or a Roman soldier or somebody, uh, and God and God just took that natural physical seed and God blessed it. And then when the baby was born, it was a blessed baby of God, but it, it happened by natural means. But that, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible makes it very clear when the angel spoke to Mary the angel said, that which is conceived in you is of the Holy Spirit. So the virgin birth is a mysterious thing. Here's another, the place, Bethlehem, the little city. Why in the world would God birth his son uh, in, the, in, in, in one of the lowliest cities on all the earth? If you went to Bethlehem today, let me tell you what you would find. If you went to Bethlehem today, and you would come to the surrounding area, and you would say to the guy that's guiding you, take me to Bethlehem. And you know what he'd say to you? You don't want to go to Bethlehem. Because Bethlehem's nothing but a ghetto. Man, if you go to Bethlehem, you might better have a weapon with you, because it's going to be bad down in Bethlehem. Well, the reason why is because Bethlehem was just a little suburb. It was an insignificant, probably one of the lowliest places. It wasn't rich. There weren't, weren't any esteem there. Yet he, the birth of the Savior of the world was at Bethlehem, this tiny little lowly place on earth. Why would God do that? Well, most likely it was because Jesus identified with lowly people, didn't he? You know, Jesus came not to save the big hot shots, not to save the mighty and the strong and the best looking people and the smartest people and the wealthiest people and the richest people. He came for those that didn't have a dime, that were the lowliest people on all the earth. So Jesus' identity with lowly purpose, I mean, my goodness, it makes sense that he was born in the lowliest city in all the earth, not in Jerusalem, not in the mansion, not in the palace, not in the temple, but in the lowliest place he could possibly be born. And what better place in the world than Bethlehem, which means house of bread, the name means house of bread, what, what better place in the world for the bread of life to be born than in the house of bread? So the mysterious place of his birth, Bethlehem, was another mystery. My goodness. And then the season of his birth is a mystery. The Bible describes, and I just read it very clearly, that when the angels were given the, me the message about a birth in Bethlehem, the angels said that the shepherds were out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and, and said, come and in the city of David you find a Savior and gave them further instructions. The point is that they were out in the fields. Now we celebrate the birth of Christ on December the 25th, of course. Yesterday was the first day of winter. Shortest day of the year uh, began winter. So it's officially winter. And even though it's 70 degrees here today and we can wear shorts and short sleeve shirt, it's winter. But in Israel, it's cold. It's winter time. I mean, their, their temperatures correspond basically with, you know, with our north. Well, you wouldn't, in Minnesota today, you probably wouldn't be wearing short pants and a, and, and a, and a long, short sleeve shirt. In Michigan, you wouldn't be. In Illinois, you wouldn't be. You know, I mean, my goodness, it's winter time. What is my point? My point is that the time, the season of Jesus' birth was certainly not December the 25th because the shepherds would not have been in the fields. The shepherd would have had the sheep in the sheep folds because there's no grass out there and everything's frozen and it's cold. 
And so Jesus was most likely born in the summer like June or May or June or sometime like that when the shepherds would have been in the fields. But so, so what, what has happened with this date? Why, why was June, December the 25th chosen to, to, to celebrate the birth of Jesus? Well, there are lots of explanations for this. Believe me, you go online, you can find bunches of explanations as to why December the 25th was chosen. But most likely, the one I like best and the one when I read it, I go, that makes you know, pretty good sense, was that December the 25th was already a festival that was celebrated with gifts and cards and celebration and candles. It was called Saturnalia. It was a feast of the, of the Roman Empire. And so all the citizens participated in this thing. And so what happened, I think, is that the early church and the disciples just took a season that was already being celebrated by the whole population and, and, and it and included gifts and presents and, and uh, celebration and decoration. And they just kind of plugged into what was already happening and gave those things sacred meaning and, and began to celebrate that in honor to Christ instead of Saturnalia. So, and I, I, look, and I don't mean, I don't think that means that we don't need to celebrate Christmas like that because it started with some pagan, some another. I think what it is, it just shows that in the mystery of godliness, that God uh, allows us to express ourselves, and, and it's not important where it came from, it's important. God, in other words, God meets us where we are. God takes advantage of where we are. And he says, use what you have. And use. Are, are you aware that most of our hymns in the hymnal came out of bars and honky-tonks? Are you aware of this? The tune to Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, and How Great Thou Art, and, 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 and uh, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. I mean, these are barroom tunes that they put godly words to, and they used it because there were no instruments in most of these little startup churches, and so they had to sing something that everybody knew the melody to. God often takes us where we are and meets us where we are. And then anoints where we are in sacred ways to honor him. And so we worship at a time of the year, which is most certainly not the time that Jesus was born. And because the reason is that the time is not important. It's what we're doing that's important. It's the fact that we take time to honor and worship and praise the birth of the Savior of this world. So there he is, the season of the birth. Here's one that is interesting to me, and I'm going to just be honest with you, the swaddling clothes. The swaddling clothes that are mentioned here, you know, the angel said, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe. Now, this has really never made a lot of sense to me because if you look up in any commentary or any Greek Hebrew dictionary and look for the word swaddling clothes and the translation in Hebrew or the translation in Greek or even the Latin translation, it says that swaddling clothes are, um, are normal uh, wrappings, just rag type wrappings that were used by the Jewish people to wrap babies and blah, blah, blah. So it would, and, and that's never made sense. How is that a sign? I mean, if all babies are wrapped with swaddling clothes, why would that be a sign? If swaddling clothes meant, you know, little strips of blankets and stuff that you just kind of make a nest and wrap them up, uh, that, how would that be a sign if every baby was wrapped up like that? Well, I was up at Christ for the Ozarks. Now, I've never been able to back this up with a commentary or a language dictionary or anything, so I'm just telling you this. Don't go to heaven and tell Jesus I said it, but... Um, <laughs> The thing, the thing, I went to Christ of the Ozarks, which is a gigantic big passion play, and they have all kind of things built around this passion play that are life-size replicas of the tabernacle and the ark and all of that. If you get a chance to go to it, it's in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. It's 
tremendous. It'd be a wonderful place to go. And they have people in, in these displays that are like old retired Jewish rabbis with the tabernacle and with some of these old Jewish things. And these guys are, you know, look just like you would think they do, have the long beard. They look like Elijah or something like that. And they're old retired rabbis, Jewish rabbis. And one of them said about the swaddling clothes that he said, let me tell you something that is Jewish tradition about these about these swaddling clothes. And he said, swaddling clothes are burial clothes. In other words, swaddling clothes are, the, are not just rags that you wrap stuff up with. They're particular. They're rags that, that, that the citizenry uses to wrap dead people. And all of a sudden it was like, now that would be a sign. If you find a baby wrapped up in burial clothes. Now that would be a sign that, that would be just flashing out at you because here would be a baby wrapped in clothes of death. And I say that if that's what that means, and it seemed likely to me that it means something like that, that that would be obvious that here was God's son from the very start that was wrapped in these essence of death, signifying the fact that the reason he came from his birth, the reason he is here from the moment he was placed on this earth, his mission was to die for sinners like you and me. And so the angel said, man, that's no mystery. That's why he came. And then here's another mystery, his incarnation. And by incarnation, incarnation means God coming in flesh. It means God putting on a man suit, flesh and blood. That's mysterious. That's hard to comprehend, the wonder of God becoming a man. When, when Jesus was born, this, this earth was wrapped with a philosophy. This philosophy is called Gnosticism. Now, it's not important that you remember the word Gnosticism. But what the Gnostics believed and so therefore what society in whole in the Roman Empire believed was a philosophy that said that this, that this cosmos was comprised of two elements. There were physical elements, physical matter, and everything physical was evil. And then there was spiritual matter, and everything spiritual was good. So their understanding would be that there's no way that God could put on flesh because God, being a spirit, could not touch flesh, which is physical and evil. And so what Jesus was, Jesus was not actually God touching flesh and putting on a human body, but that Jesus was some kind of a phantom or some kind of a ghost that simply appeared to put on a body and therefore he could be worshipped as, as some kind of a translucent spirit that really didn't have a physical body but appeared as though he had a body. Now John, the Gospel of John, straightens that little concept out. The Gospel of John says in the first chapter, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And by Him were all things made. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us as of the only begotten Son of God. So the Bible clearly says, God put on flesh. But that's a man, the wonder of that. The wonder is mysterious of how God can clothe himself with flesh. Lots of mysteries here in these first few verses of Luke about the birth of Christ. But there's one more, one more mystery that I think probably is the greatest mystery of all. And it's not physical and it's not spiritual. It's not supernatural phenomenon and all that stuff, but it's still, it's probably the easiest one for us to imagine and identify with. And this is the mystery. Why do you suppose? 
that the innkeeper found no room for Jesus. I mean, after all, Jesus was adored by millions. His birth was heralded by angels. His body was in, in, inside a, a young woman that the angel had spoken to the inhabitants and said, don't be afraid, this is the Son of God. The prophets had spoken for thousands of years. Millions of people would give themselves to Christ and be totally affected in their lives on this earth. And it seems to me that God could have prepared something so an innkeeper would find some kind of room for Jesus in that inn that night. Jesus, Joseph and Mary show up on a donkey and she's obviously heavy with child. They call on the innkeeper. Is there any room in the inn? Man, my wife is heavily pregnant here and this is going to be a bad time and, and she seems to be starting into labor. Man, you got a room for us? And the innkeeper says, sorry, we don't have any room. You're going to have to go somewhere else. There's a stable back there behind the place. I mean, you can, if you can push the cows and the sheep out of the way, you know, you can get in there and maybe have a baby, you know, back there, but we don't have any room for you in the inn. And so it's a mystery to me. It's a, why, why did he not have any room for Jesus on that day? Well, he's not too much unlike many of us who this day, we don't make much room for Jesus either. I mean, there are many of us who celebrate, revel, feast, party, enjoy the birth of Jesus. And yet we make no room for Jesus in our heart. We make no room for Jesus to come into our life and be a guest in our life. So the mystery of no room for Jesus is a mystery that involves the Christmas season and yet we slam the door in the face of of, of, the, of the guest of honor. And not only do we not want him in our lives, we don't want, even want him around. Why would we not recognize this? Why would we not recognize Jesus? Why, why did the innkeeper shut the door and found no room for Jesus? Well, I think I'm going to give you about three reasons quickly. Number one, he wasn't expecting Jesus. In other words, he had no prior information about Jesus. Why, right, why, why, why did the innkeeper say, no, go away? Uh, I mean, I have to assume that Joseph tried to bargain with him and tried to inform him about something like, hey, this is going to be a special birth. Or Joseph might have said, you don't know who you're turning away. Or he might have had some kind of instruction about this. But the shepherd, I doubt whether the shepherd, I mean, I doubt whether the innkeeper had, uh, had searched the scriptures and, 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 and he didn't know and he wasn't expecting uh, uh, some big event. And, and when it came to, to letting him in, he had no plans to receive, no intent, nothing really special about this. And so he wasn't ready. He wasn't prepared to consider that this was important. Do you know what one thing is most likely the most important thing in a congregation like this or in your own personal Christian life? You know what will make the most difference in what we are and what we receive? It's our expectancy. What do we expect? I mean, do we expect Jesus Christ to return, to be... Do we expect to be confronted by Jesus Christ? One of the consistent witnesses all through the New Testament of all of the Christians that were involved in the New Testament, one of, one of, one of the consistent expectations from them was they expected Jesus to come back during their lifetime. The Apostle Paul thought, he would never see death. Peter said, you know, he'll come back quickly. All of the New Testament Christians said, he's at the door and he'll be back before we're called. They had a great expectation that Jesus was going to come back to them and they expected the Lord's return. And there was a word that they used in Christianity back then that, that, was, that, that became an anthem for them and it was the word Maranatha. The word Maranatha means 
The Lord is coming. And so when they greeted each other in the street, they would say, Maranatha. When they would meet in some secret place, the term would be Maranatha. When they would gather in some little tiny back room somewhere because the Roman government was trying to find them and they couldn't have big open church meetings, they had to hide themselves in the back rooms away from the government and they, were, they trembled back there in fear. When somebody knocked on the door, the password was, was Maranatha. When they were taken in the Colosseum and they were being fed to lions. When the, when the sands of the Colosseum floor were red with the blood of those that had been sacrificed there. When, when they were marching up to the, to, the, to the altar to be burned at the stake for their testimony of Jesus, they would encourage each other by shouting, Maranatha, Maranatha, the Lord is coming, have no fear. But today, many people don't believe that. Today, people, many people have no expectation of the return of the Lord. Churches don't preach that Jesus is coming again. They don't want to get involved in causing some controversy about, about Christ and his soon return. Many people don't believe that he's coming again. This innkeeper missed it. He missed the best opportunity of his life. It could have, had, it could have transformed his life. So as we start 2019 in just a couple of weeks, I'll tell you a little secret that I believe we need to grab onto. Something that will revitalize our life and change the way that we live Grab on to some expectancy. The expectation to see Jesus and receive Jesus and hope and faith and life and victory. Live in a constant expectation of the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Go to the window every morning and, and throw open your blinds and look out and say, uh, is today the day? Could Jesus come today? Come, Lord Jesus. And that expectation will change the way you live and change the way you think about life. This could be the day. I'm expecting Jesus to come back again. I don't want to miss Christ because I'm not expecting him in life. Here's another one. It's very closely related to expectation. Uh, he didn't recognize him. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it wouldn't be unusual that he didn't recognize him. Because he wasn't even born yet. Mm. He was inside Mary's body. I mean, you know, who would expect something that you can't even see? So, this recognizing something is very, close, is very closely related to the expectation you have in life. Uh, uh, follow me. If you're expecting trouble, you're going to find trouble. If you're expecting love, you're going to find love, right? Because pretty much we find what we're expecting in life. So if, 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 we, if we want to find Christ, if we want to find happiness, if we want to find joy, then we need to be looking for life, looking for joy, looking for Christmas. You know, there are people, people who have the, the ghost of Christmas grunch. I don't know if you're around where it is. And the more religious we are, the more likely it is that we have the ghost of the spirit of grunch in our life. And we look at the ornaments and we look at the balls and we look at the trees and we look at the presents and we look at the gifts and we look at the lights and we look at the ads and we look at all the shopping and so forth and we say, this shouldn't be because this is not what Christmas is about. And to you, I would say that even though we do shop and we do have presents and we do have lights and we do give gifts and we do celebrate, if you will look for Jesus in it, you will find Jesus. And don't be griping and complaining and shutting yourself up 
because it's not going like you do because if you do, you're going to miss. You're not going to recognize him. But if you're expecting to find him, you're going to find him in all of that. Just like the guys that were on the road to Emmaus in Luke 14. You remember this? When Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem and, and, the, and, and, and the couple of disciples were walking down the road to Emmaus because they had lost hope. They thought he would have been the one to deliver Israel, but now he's dead and it's the third day and, and he, he didn't rise like they said he was going to rise. And so their expectations were burning low and they were going back to Emmaus where they came from and they were talking to each other about, oh, I wish he had been the one. I thought he would have been the one. We were praying that he would be the one, but I guess he wasn't the one because it's been three years and then all of a sudden here comes Jesus and, and walks up right beside him and puts his arm around him and says, hey guys, well, what you talking about that you're so sad? And he said, are you? They said, are you a stranger and you're the only one that don't know, don't know what happened here? Uh, he said, what happened about what? He said, Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about, that, that he was greatly from God and he was crucified in his three days. And then the Bible says, then beginning at Moses and the prophets, this unknown character began to expose to them in all of the word of God the things concerning himself. And he sat down with them and started to break the bread. And then when he broke the bread, the Bible says, and they recognized him. Do you know why they didn't recognize him on the road? Because they didn't expect to. They thought he was dead. They were counting him gone. And I'm just saying to you that in the Christmas season, if you don't expect Jesus, you're going to miss him. You're going to turn away one of the greatest opportunities to see Christ in all of your life because you're not expecting to see him. You don't recognize him because you're not expecting to see him. Let me, let me create a, a, a homespun word for you. Um... um terminological expectancy. <laughs> In other words, we, we, we create a term and then we create rules that that term means and those rules are so rigid that if what happens doesn't meet that, then we throw it away. Terminology, terminological rigidity. There we go. That's a good word. Terminological rigidity. And listen, that's what we do with Christmas. Christmas. We create such strict rules about what Christmas means that anything that doesn't happen that meets those expectations, we pretend as if it doesn't exist. Here's this guy. How, how, I mean, the, the innkeeper, uh, how unlike the shepherds who, when they heard that Christ was born, man, they jumped on it and they ran down there and said, let us go see this thing which has come to pass. They were excited about it, enthused about it. Unlike the wise men that were far east and they saw a star and they started a year and a half to two year journey to Bethlehem. Pumped up, excited, bringing gifts and all that kind of stuff. Man, how unlike Simeon. Have you heard, ever heard about Simeon? Simeon was this guy, this priest in the temple. Let me just read what happened to him. This is it. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was a just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, waiting for Jesus to be born. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all the peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of God your people. I, Here's a man never saw Jesus in his life. Here comes a, a people in uh, with a little tiny infant to do what the Jews do who have to circumcise them. That's what he's talking about. And they just bring him in for the normal, regular circumcision type deal to go on. And they just pick him up. And when Simeon picks this little one up, the Holy Spirit just poof, pierces his heart. Why? Because he was looking for it. He was praying for it. And the Lord said, let me show you what this is right here. And Simeon saw what he needed to see because he expected to see what he was willing to see. And then here's the last one. He didn't let him in because he just simply didn't want him. Yeah. I mean, look, this guy 
had an end to run. People were all in there. The whole, all the rooms were filled. Having a baby born in this motel that was full of people was going to be a problem. Because babies mess stuff up. Right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, I want to tell you something. When Justin was born, the first night we went home, Daniel testified to this. The first night we took Justin home from the hospital, he cried all night long. I looked at her about halfway through the night. I said, let's take him back. <laughs> He's obviously defective. <laughs> and she finally talked me into keeping him. But, but we called my mama and her mama, and we said, Mom, what do we do? We wanted a child, but didn't, we didn't want our, this child to completely destroy our lives. Of course, you people that have any sense and have been through some children yourself, you know, after you know, a day or two, he kind of, kind of toned down. But I'm just saying, children are a disruption in life. And one of the reasons the innkeeper didn't find a room might be that he just simply didn't want all that distraction and he didn't want all of that trouble. He didn't want to have to call the doctor. He didn't want to have to disturb the guests. He didn't want the arrival of a new baby to mess up the flow of what was going on in his holiday inn there. That's right, didn't have time for him. When you let Christ come in your life, he'll really change things around. He'll shake things up. He'll disturb you. I don't know, a lot of you think about the saving Christ and the healing Christ and the forgiving Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. What Jesus does most often is he bothers you. When you let him in, he's disturbing you. <laughs> That's right. And this man probably had his own schedule. He had it all set up. He would blow the lights out at 8 o'clock at night, and he would rise early. And, 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 and a baby being born in that inn would, would greatly uh, uh, upset things. And the truth of the matter was he just didn't want Jesus there. Like Felix. You know, Felix was a Roman governor, and the Apostle Paul stood before Felix and said, you're living with another man's wife. You're committing adultery, guy. you got to stop that. And Felix looked at Paul and said, uh, I'm being convicted about what you're saying, but come back when you have a more convenient season. Almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Almost. Come, come back when it's more convenient. In other words, go away. I don't have any room for you. You know why he didn't have any room? Because he already had a guest in his heart. That guest was lust. That's what was occupying the room in his heart. Or how about the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, from the time I was a child, I wanted to be a Christian. What do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus, realizing that things were the most important thing in his life, looked at him and said, go sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and then come follow me. And the Bible said he went away sad because he had great possessions. The reason the rich young ruler didn't come to Jesus is because he already had a guest in his heart. And the guest was possession. So how do we receive Jesus? Well, all through the Bible, the, the word is, is, is the same. How do, we, how do we open up our inn and let Jesus have a room here? The Bible clearly says that Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And if any man will open the door, Christ will come in and, and, and have fellowship with you, and you can have fellowship with with him, if the rooms aren't full of something else. And Christ doesn't ask you to give up anything except what you would want to give up if you had enough sense to want it. Jesus doesn't come to take away from your life. He comes to add to your life. Jesus doesn't come to, to be a party pooper in life. He came to give you joy and victory in life. He just wants to make your life wonderful. That's all he wants. 
He wants to be born in you so he can give to you, not take from you. He can bless you and not curse you. So I've never understood why the innkeeper could not find room for Jesus that night. But let me confess to you in, in just this last little word that there's one more mystery that is harder for me to understand than the mystery of the innkeeper not making room, and that is why we don't make room for Jesus in our heart. Because this is no secret. Jesus wants to be born in your heart. Every one of us. There's no collective salvation. You're not going to heaven on the Freedom River Church plan. You're not going to get to heaven and when you're asked, why should I let you in, which is just a purely physical concept, but it makes a point. You're not going to be able to say, uh, here's, my, here's a card from Freedom River Church and, and I, I'm a member there, let me in. No, 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 no. And, you, and God has no grandchildren either. Because your mom and daddy know Christ doesn't mean you know him. Or your children. It's personal. He comes to the end of your heart right now. And he's knocking on the door. And he's saying, if you'll open up and let me in. And we look at this innkeeper and we say, what a reject. What an idiot. The first holiday innkeeper in the world that could have had no worldwide notoriety for opening the door and letting the Son of God come in, and he blew it. The Holy Spirit's knocking on your heart. Are you going to make room for Jesus this season? It's not too late. Well,